Awesome. So uh, thanks again. We'll get started back. Uh, something my wife and I always talk about is when you decide to, do, uh, to commit to something, you're saying no to something else. So thank you guys for uh, spending this time with us. Now, the, fortunately, it's going to be pretty rewarding because we have Melissa Johnson followed by Jason Porter to end the conference, which I think you always, uh, let's end, always end with a really strong suit. So Melissa Johnson, uh, I'm proud to say she's one of my partners, um, and she uh, practices at Tennessee Oncology, but she also runs the, uh, pro is the program director of the Lung Cancer Research Program at Sarah Cannon. Uh, if you've ever heard her talk, you know we're in for a delight. And so Melissa, thank you. Thanks, Davey. Good morning, everybody. This is going to be a wild and crazy ride through local lung cancer. I was in New York uh, on Friday and was trying to think of a good joke to go with the local train and the, uh, the local elevator, which is what, the one that stops on every floor. Um, but I couldn't find anything that was funny. So we're just going to talk about local lung today. Now, J Dr. Porter's going to go after me, and he's going to talk to you about metastatic disease. But of course, for every tumor type, the springboard to how we treat early stage lung is in the metastatic setting. So just to level set, you know, here's sort of the, the paradigm for how we work up a lung cancer uh, that is uh, found to be advanced or metastatic. We need PDL1 and we need NGS. And then based on uh, and plus histology of the tumor, right? Um, based on those three uh, uh, factors, we're able to assign therapy and hopefully follow the patient for a long time. So what about early disease? What about uh, if we're not trying to just palliate and control the cancer if we're trying to cure it? Well, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, today we're going to talk about neoadjuvant, chemo-IO, followed by surgery. We're going to talk about adjuvant-IO um, after surgery, and then we're also going to talk about uh, locally advanced therapy, um, chemoradiation, followed by IO. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about all of that in 20 minutes. Um, this is uh, right now what the paradigm for workup. We are lucky if we get PDL1 uh, from the early stage specimen. We are lucky if we get PDL1 from the surgically resected specimen. And oh, by the way, we're asking for EGFR. Uh, for the in the surgically resected specimen, but this is uh, this is not without gnashing of teeth and and pushing and uh, screaming sometimes to get this done. I'm going to show you uh, where I think we're going with respect to that. Uh, here's our outline. We're going to just ta just touch a couple trials in each of the disease indications that are framing what we do today, and I think are influencing um, the questions of the future. Okay, so we'll start with neoadjuvant uh, chemo IO and sometimes followed by adjuvant uh, therapy. So we'll start with a case. Let's get everybody warmed up, get your lung cancer uh, uh, juices flowing. Um, this is a patient of mine, 53-year-old, former 60-pack year smoker. He had smoked a lot. Uh, he lives and works here in town, and he presented to a local emergency room with abdominal pain. The workup showed a right lower lobe mass. Um, his PFTs performed or ordered by the surgeon, uh, who was my, uh, my partner, um, showed okay, uh, FEV1, uh, 50%, not super great. Um, DLCO was perfect. Um, and the bronchoscopy for diagnosis showed that this was a squamous cancer with a 25% PDL1. So you can think about what you and your tumor board would think about doing. Here's what my thoracic surgeon said. She said, can you give a little something? You know, it's right up next to the uh, major fissure. I'm worried that even I, that I'm going to have to do a bilobectomy, and I need it to be a little smaller. Can you just give a little something? So what is that these days? Is it chemo? Is it chemo radiation? Is it chemotherapy and immunotherapy? I hope most of us now would say chemo immunotherapy with the hopes of shrinking the cancer and even perhaps downstaging it, getting it off of the major fissure, which was the case for this patient. Now, so, and the reason for that is this trial, Checkmate 816, uh, in which patients with 1B to 3A non small cell lung cancer, both histologies were randomized to nevo chemo versus chemotherapy. So the chemotherapy, obviously, in this day and age, platinum, uh, 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 platinum. Uh, uh, taxane for patients that have squamous cancer, platinum pemetrexid for patients with non-squamous cancer. And we have this fantastic result for, in terms of pathologic uh, complete response, so PATH-CR means at the time of surgery, the cancer spot has no active cancer left. 
Um, and that was true in 22% more patients that got Nevo chemo versus only 2% with chemo alone. And this is, this is what we know to be true. Chemo sometimes works, but a lot of time doesn't. And so the addition of immunotherapy just at face value um, were, uh, results in a lot more patients having no cancer left at the time of surgical resection. As we've had more and more long-term follow-up from this Checkmate 816 trial, including the event-free survival shown in the bottom left, you see that patients' event-free survival, so, so any event, including disease progression, death, um, or, uh, or recurrent disease, um, patients that got Nevo chemo, much less likely, median event-free survival of 32 months, so over two years, versus chemotherapy alone, um, about a year and a half, uh, with chemotherapy. And then lastly, and this is still immature, but overall survival, like in the patients in the, in the neoadjuvant setting, we are hoping to cure these patients. And look, here, we still see separation of the curves, the hazard ratio 0.6, and a significant p-value in favor of adding nivolumab to chemotherapy. So as a result of uh, this data, the FDA and the EMA have approved um, the, uh, the Nevo chemo for patients uh, with uh, early stage lung cancer. Now, let's just dive into the details a little bit because I'm preaching to the choir in this room about how great this is, but you have to go back and talk to your surgeons and maybe convince your radiation oncologists that they should not uh, intervene and let you go first. And so these are some of the data points that I would highlight as to why. Well, first of all, there were more patients that ended up having surgery that got Nevo chemo versus patients that got chemotherapy alone. Uh, fewer actually received the, the surgical uh, intervention that was, that was planned. Furthermore, here's the median duration of the surgery less for patients that got chemo IO versus uh, longer surgeries with, of course, more complications and more time in the hospital. The depth of pathologic regression, also a cool endpoint to talk about. So each of these lines is a patient, and the percentage that uh, the line goes down is the amount that the cancer shrunk at the time that the pathologist is looking at it underneath the microscope. And so this line here, which is probably hard to see from the back of the room, is only 10% or left viable tumor at the time of surgical resection. So you can see from the back of the room that there are more patients that got Nevo chemo who resulted in, in almost and less than 10% viable cancer. Because of course, if there's less cancer left, then there's less of a chance that any of it escaped and got outside of the cancer and might be wandering off into the liver or the bones somewhere else. This is an interesting uh, analysis to the path CR8 by stage. And it would suggest that patients that had smaller cancers, 1B, um, and cancers that hadn't figured out how to spread to the lymph nodes were more likely to shrink. Um, and they may be the patients in whom this is helping the most. I think this is probably a little skewed because remember the stage 1B cancers are relatively smaller than, than the stage 2 and stage 3 um, because of this uh, event-free survival by subgroup. This data came later. So if you focus on the left-hand panels, you see stage 1 and 2 tumors treated with nevochemo versus chemo on the top and stage 3 cancers at the bottom. So remember what stage 3 cancers are. Okay, those are big cancers. They are T4 lesions, so big and near the middle of the chest, or they have lymph node involvement, and in particular, those lymph nodes in the mediastinum. So those lymph nodes, they're getting ready to launch into the rest of the body. And here you see very clearly that the patients that do the best are those that are closer to having locally advanced disease. So the Nevo added to the chemo, I believe, is, is starting to work on the lymph nodes. It's starting to get rid of the cancer that is poised to leave the chest, and that's how we will cure patients with lung cancer. Now, uh, this is another interesting and sort of sobering uh, subgroup by PDL1. Damn it! It looks like those patients that are PDL1 less than one percent are not getting any benefit from the nivolumab after all. And it is the patients that have tumors that are uh, one percent and higher that where the benefit is much more significant. And so, what does that mean? 
we need to know PDL one before we go to the operating room. Um, so we just uh, t tuck that away for later. Um, last analysis, uh, getting a little bit more fancy now, looking at those patients who had a path CR rate, so no cancer left at the time of resection, versus those that had at 10% or more viable cancer when the uh, cancer specimen was removed. Those patients that had path CR rate were much more likely to have um, event-free survival going on further. So if you have a path CR rate, that is associated with a higher event-free survival or a better event-free survival, and that is something that you can tell your patients. No cancer at the time um, uh, that the path report is final means that it is less likely that this cancer is gonna come back. And so, of course, as we think about adjuvant therapy, that's a relevant piece of information to know. And then finally, this is um, also forecasting for the future, but the uh, event-free survival was analyzed based, uh, based upon CT DNA clearance. So if there was no cancer left in the blood specimen that was taken at the time of the surgery, that was associated um, with, uh, with higher pathologic complete responses. You see in the Nevo chemo arm, al almost 50% of patients that had no CT DNA left in the blood we're gonna have a past CR rate. So how is that helpful? Well, one day we will check a blood specimen after three cycles of Nevo chemo, and if there is no CT DNA, we will know that it is more likely that that patient at the time of surgery is gonna have a better event-free survival. Um, so trying to start to get us some tools that we can use at the outset to identify who these patients are that should get Nevo chemo. Okay. So that's fine. Um, let's talk about a second case. Oh, no, this is the same case. Sorry, this is my 53-year-old gentleman, 60-pack year smoker. So you see on the left, his uh, PET scan pre-treatment, his target lesion, 44 by uh, 39. And then you see after two cycles, we did another PET. Looks like it's shrinking. Um, unconfirmed uh, partial response in the, in the, on the uh, imaging. And then we did one more cycle, still looking good, target lesion down to 17 by 17, and now a confirmed uh, partial response based on imaging of 61%. But the PATH report came back, and it showed right lower lobe resection, lots of fibrosis, which is what happens when cancer cells die, but there was also necrotic can uh, squamous carcinoma and a minimal amount of viable squamous cancer, cancer present present in the hilar margin, presumably part of a bronchial lymph node. No, what happened to my hypothesis about the immune therapy being able to get rid of all the cancer? And, and so what did I say? I said, crap. Um, okay, and so what do you tell your patients? You need more chemo. But doc, you said I only need three cycles. You need port, post-operative radiation therapy. No, we don't really do that anymore. You need immunotherapy. Well, we got some Nevo and it didn't really help. You need more chemo and more immune therapy. Um, the, uh, the short answer is we don't yet know. But what we have was this FDA approval based on Checkmate 816. So what did they do in that trial? This is the, the uh, announce, or this is the press release. And in the body of the press release, I think I found this, or no, th sorry, this was from the New England Journal paper. Adjuvant chemo was received, was received in only 12% of patients in the NEVO group and 22% of patients in the control group. It was optional for patients in the 816 trial. You did not have to have any other therapy, which means that my surgeon is saying, nope, you don't need any more therapy. You're good. You're going to be cured, except that there was, there was squamous cancer in those damn lymph nodes. And so he wasn't cured, and we couldn't stop. Um, any subsequent cancer therapy was received by 20% versus 43% um, in the chemo nevo versus the uh, chemotherapy uh, arm of the trial, including systemic therapy. So I, I reinforce this because um, this, do, this didn't help me. I didn't have the data from 816 to decide what to do. So I did more chemotherapy, um, and, and that uh, has kept him now disease-free um, for four years. Um, since uh, he was uh, part of the initial trial, uh, which is great, but it, it, does, it means that there are still more questions that we have to answer. So there are many uh, pr uh, perioperative trials ongoing right now. Nadim 2 is one of them that was reported and sort of talked about quite a bit this year. 
This is a Spanish trial. It's almost identical to the Checkmate 816 with one, uh, one important e exception. First of all, all patients got carbotaxol um, with Nevo versus carbotaxol alone. And then they went to surgery. But then all patients um, in, the, in the experimental arm, at least, got another year of nivolumab. So this is why I call it perioperative therapy, because now we're extending the immunotherapy for a year after, which is what we're doing with adjuvant patients, right? Um, and uh, so there was all sorts of bells and whistles, stools, blood, tumor samples. Um, we're not going to talk about that. But I do want to show that the results were very analogous to the Checkmate 816. Um, patients that were able to go forward with definitive surgery, 93% when they got Nevo. So this is the data that you tell your surgeon who says, mm, I don't know if it's as good an operation. Actually, it's easier to do a definitive surgery. What about downstaging? We never talk about that with chemotherapy alone. 70% of patients uh, had, were downstaged versus 40% with chemotherapy. And once again, uh, impressive uh, PFS, equivalent to EFS, uh, uh, separation of the curves, and so far, immature overall survival. But again, suggesting that the Nevo chemo arm is better. OK. So um, let me show you another case to show you that we still don't have all the answers. This is a 60-year-old African-American female came to see me with uh, this imaging. Um, she got uh, three cycles of carbo, pemetrexid, nivolumab, um, and uh, she said, I feel great. And oh, by the way, miraculously, from her bronchoscopy specimen, we knew that she was adenocarcinoma, and we knew that her PDL1 was 75 to 100 percent. And so I just really felt like this was a, like this was a home run this time. And she like, I feel great, doc. And she, I was like, this is great. She feels good. Um, and and it, you know. It, that was before, that was after, and I told myself, well, that's scarring. That's necrosis in there. That's definitely fibrosis. That is dead cancer. Um, and the right upper lobe and the right lower lobe showed metastatic adenocarcinoma with one of six lymph nodes involved that wasn't involved uh, at baseline. And so I said, crap, again, and said, OK, we're not done. We got to do um, more uh, uh, chemotherapy. During the time that her chemotherapy, during her adjuvant chemotherapy, I thought, I do not have a good handle on what's going on with this lady. And so I sent her path uh, surgical specimen for next generation sequencing and got a BRAF mutation. This lady had a BRAF V600E. So if I had known that, or, or you know, and it could have been an EGFR or it could have been ALK, would I have done the Nevo chemo? Probably not. I would have wanted to give this patient some sort of targeted therapy because we know that that works better. And so all of this to say knowledge is power, and knowing it out back ain't helping anybody. It's helping her now uh, complete. Uh, <laughs> so she got carbo, pemetrexid, uh, Nevo uh, uh, preoperatively, and she got four cycles of cystocytaxel second line, or, or post-op. So, and she's still feeling great, amazingly, but um, she could also not be feeling so great. And so this suggests um, to me that both adjuvant therapy will likely be necessary in most of our patients, and we need more information up front. OK. So some of you are thinking, yeah, that's fine. But my surgeon ain't going to let me touch this cancer until it's taken out and in the bucket. And so I'm just going to wait and do adjuvant therapy. And you, you, you would be right. You, uh, you can do that based on the Empower 110 trial. That, uh, in which patients uh, had to have some uh, uh, cisplatin-based chemotherapy, if only one cycle. They didn't have to have all four, but they did have to be fit enough to get some, so thereby selecting a pretty fit patient population. They were randomized to a TESO versus best supportive care uh, for 16 cycles or a, uh, about a year. And the primary endpoint was uh, the uh, event-free survival in patients with stage 2 and 3A lung, lung cancer. You see a hazard ratio of 0 0.8. They, um, uh, so patients that got a year of a TESO did better than patients that got best supportive care. And when you look at patients that were pdl one expressing, there's even a little bit more separation of the curves, hazard ratio a little bit better, 0.66. So this was the indication that the FDA approved. Um, 
for all comers, uh, uh, 1B to 3A, so all the adjuvant uh, patients in the trial, the hazard ratio was 0.8 and almost abutted the, uh, uh, the confidence interval, almost crossed one. And so this um, is a little bit outside of what the FDA approved. But it does suggest uh, that we need to look a little harder about who the patients were that were getting benefit. It's easy to say, okay, you can get your year of, of atezolizumab, and if I can't get a hold of you beforehand, this is at least how I can give you immunotherapy out back. But check, a look, check out the subgroup based on pdl one status. And, you, and we see here, this was uh, based on the initial report, that patients that had no level of pdl one did not benefit from the atezolizumab, and patients with high levels were the ones that really did. So the EMA uh, took this data and approved atezolizumab only in this 50% uh, cohort, um, but those of us in the U.S. are fortunate. As long as we see some amount of pdl one we can give it. Now, now we have overall survival data, though, because, and that's the end of the line for all the adjuvant trials, right? Does it help cure patients? Does it help patients live longer? And it doesn't in many of our patients. Here's the ITT, or sorry, here's the, um, the uh, all randomized patients. Here's the ITT. No difference in overall survival for those patients that were treated with a TESO um, versus best supportive care. A little bit of a difference, but the confidence interval crossed one for those. This is the group of patients in whom atezolizumab is approved in the US. And so finally, damn it, we get back to the PDL1. 50% and higher are the ones where there may be an overall survival benefit. So those are the ones that are benefiting. Um, and it's getting harder and harder to argue with that. So there again, we need PDL1. Just uh, two slides on the PEARLS trial that is, uh, that is, co is confusing, and, um, and, but it is part of the lexicon now. And it's the same uh, adjuvant trial as the, as the um, Empowered 010, only with Pembro, not a TESO, same group of patients. And um, uh, patients were strongly, uh, uh, strongly recommended for patients to have had adjuvant chemotherapy, but it wasn't required. Um, and so this patient population is a little bit different. Patients were randomized to Pembro versus placebo. And here we see that in the, whoopsie, in the overall, in the, in, uh, for disease-free survival that's shown on the left-hand side, there was a little bit of a difference. Um, but when you look at the patients that are 50% higher, so the patients with high levels of pdl one in that group of patients, there's a cross in the curve and no improvement in, in disease-free survival. And in the overall survival, uh, curve, you see there was no difference with Pembro versus best supportive care. I think there's a lot of confusion about what this really, what this really says. What, the, what I take away, it was a trial, I think, largely enrolled in Europe, and so maybe a group of patients that was a little different, um, but it does tell us uh, that in the adjuvant setting, it's more difficult to show a benefit. And we should take that away, that if you are telling yourself that giving adjuvant immunotherapy is as good as trying to get it in the neoadjuvant setting, you're fooling yourself. OK, last, because I've already run into Jason's time. Um, just a couple of slides on uh, the locally advanced setting, because that's the other place that we're using chemo and immunotherapy. Uh, Pacific five-year survival data. We're very proud that uh, David Spiegel, um, who's also a partner in Tennessee Oncology, presented this data. Davy Daniel, chief medical officer at Wild Oncology, was among the authors on this um, uh, uh, publication that changed the standard of care for patients with locally advanced cancer that was unresectable. Um, patients, of course, got chemo radiation and then were randomized to receive dervalumab or placebo. And now at five years, uh, the bottom graph is PFS, the top graph is overall survival. So 43% of patients are alive and disease uh, alive uh, at five years, which is unheard of for stage three cancer. But of course, that does mean that there were 60% uh, roughly that are dead. And so that, is, that suggests that this is a great first step, but we are not done. Uh, uh, figuring out how to treat these patients. Okay, and I'm going to beat my um, I'm going to beat my drum one more time as we look at the PDL1 express uh, sub subgroups. We see that the patients with lower levels of PDL1, um, or sorry, higher levels of PDL1 did better, and those with lower levels of PDL1 did 
not as well, um, maybe didn't benefit from Dervalumab to the same degree. And so now, as we move forward, this was part of Dr. Spiegel's presentation, um, there's a subgroup analysis looking at PDL1 using the DACO assay that we use in lung cancer, 1% and less than 1%. And look at that curve. That's not great at all. So if you have a patient, and by the way, if you don't test, you don't know. So a lot of times when you, are, when you have a patient in front of you and you are struggling, that patient may be PDL1 low or maybe PDL1 high. But if you knew that information, you might step away from the Dervalumab and do something else. If you knew that patient had a BRAF mutation, you definitely would step away from the Dervalumab and think about something else. Um, and so knowledge is, again, power. And it is these patients with PDL1 expressing tumors that are doing well. This is a real-world uh, outcomes uh, from ESMO last month uh, in a Canadian group of patients. There are some that criticize the Pacific, that those trials or that those patients were superstars. I don't recall that my patients were superstars that went on that trial. Dr. Daniel, do you remember that? But that's the criticism of, of the trial, and this is a real-world uh, uh, group of Canadian patients. And here again we see, for, here's the overall group, and here's the PDL one less than 1%. And here's the PDL1 50%. So the patients with high, higher expression, uh, expression of PDL1 are the ones that are benefiting. Okay, well, what about um, those patients that uh, can't get concurrent chemo rads? You know who they are. You try, you really, really want to give them carbotaxol weekly for six weeks plus radiation. But when they come in in the wheelchair and they got the oxygen on and you think, oh no, we are, and, and they have brittle diabetes, we'll give them. Those are the patients that you think, mm, maybe we'll do sequential. <laughs> and so um, this Pacific Six enrolled patients, uh oh. That's my second to last slide, by the way. Hang on, we're almost done. Um, the Pacific Six enrolled patients that had a good performance status and got con concurrent and had a poor performance status or for whatever reason got sequential chemoradiation, and they did just as well. And so that gives us a lot of, um, it gives me peace of mind because you just find for whatever reason you end up in, these, in this place where you give chemo uh, and they don't do well and so you f consolidate with radiation and then you think, okay, I'm gonna give immunotherapy and that's probably the right thing to do there. But what about the 60% that are dead at five years? What about the 70% that have progressed um, at five years? We have to keep moving forward. And here are four different trials. Pacific 2 and I think Pacific 4 are enrolled fully. Pacific 8 and Pacific 9 are not. Looking at different strategies for doing that. First of all, can we add Dervalumab to the chemo radiation? Um, and does that help galvanize the neoantigens earlier? Is that the way to bring benefit to more patients? Can we do this with SBRT? some radiation oncologists uh, in Tennessee, or Tennessee oncology and one oncology that would be very interested to be doing more SBRT plus Dervalumab. That trial's also enrolled. Can you add um, a TIGIT uh, antibody to the, uh, the Dervalumab, and does it work better than Dervalumab alone? Or this is uh, 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 monolizumab, which uh, is a natural killer-directed uh, therapy. Oak, uh, it's a Aleclumab, there we go, uh, CD73 plus uh, Dervalumab, and um, this is uh, similar to a uh, trial done in the neoadjuvant space, but can we add other drugs that make the Dervalumab work in this PDL1 low expressing tumor? So to be continued, we're not, well, we don't know all the answers yet, but I would uh, suggest to you that we need to know PDL1 and we need to know NGS from the very beginning. And we probably need to be do checking ctDNA after surgery to figure out what are we going to do next. And so for those of you that, were so, that are in industry and were so nice to stay until the end, and you ask me, what can we do? And I can say, you can help us get this testing done in the early stage setting. You can lobby uh, healthcare systems and lobby uh, path pathologists, pathology groups, to help them understand the importance of this testing early on when the cancer looks like this. Um, and that's uh, how we will work together to cure more patients with lung cancer. Thank you. Awesome. So get your questions together in your mind. So I totally agree. My patients looked like the community on the Pacific trial. Mm -hmm. I had an 81-year-old on that trial. So you tell us, um, 
FDA is pushing for trials that better represent the US, better represent our communities. <laughs> um, there are barriers to that. Yeah. How do we overcome those? Well, I think um, the Pacific trial is a good example where AstraZeneca listened. Uh, because remember, as, at the, as that trial started, you, you had to start Dervalumab or placebo within 14 days of finishing your chemo radiation, and that is tough. Like, they are still super inflamed at that point, and coughing, and short of breath, and feel like doo-doo, and so um, nobody was enrolling to the trial. And so uh, 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 David Spiegel was, I, I think, on the steering committee for that trial, and they, he and others said, look, this is not realistic. And, um, and I think, uh, and that was, uh, then they lengthened uh, the, the window to 42 days which frankly I still find is kind of hard. That's still pretty tight for some of my patients that have had um, complications from their chemo radiation. But it was an example where uh, we worked together as a collaborative team and you said, this isn't real life. And AstraZeneca said, okay, what would be real life? And I think that's how we'll, we, we will uh, solve the problem that you suggest. That, look, it is not realistic for us to do a trial in which pdl one has to be confirmed centrally. So how can we work together? We cannot do a trial in frontline small cell because everybody gets their first line or first cycle of therapy in the hospital. So how do we work together better to enroll more trials, uh, more patients on trials with small cell. I can think of two easy examples. So inclusion, exclusion, the schema, trial schema, what about site selection and things like that? What are the things that are really creating havoc that are slowing this down? Yeah, that, uh, thanks, Davey. That's a, uh, that's a great, big, open question. I think right now the truth is that your, uh, uh, your, your potential future success as a site is determined by your past successes. And, and we all know that, that we can't always rely on how things were in the past. So right now, you know, Tennessee Oncology did you know, a big goose egg on a particular trial. And so we have a black mark uh, with that sponsor uh, on trials that will be enrolled in the future. We need to have dialogue about that too. Um, because if uh, we, uh, often I am told as the director of the lung program, okay, you can have two sites. And maybe one of those sites is Tennessee Oncology in Nashville, and you can have four clinics. Well, what is that doing? Except making my partners mad because I want to tell, I tell them about this trial, but they can't enroll, and they ain't gonna uh, uh, refer their patient to a clinic that's just down the road that's a little bit closer uh, to the middle of Nashville. Like this is, uh, this is an area where we are not listening. I would counter that, that, I would reinforce that that actually decreases the diversity in trials, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. maybe pharma is, is reflect, uh, understands that, but maybe the CROs are the ones saying that cost is just too much, yep. I can't do it. Yeah, th yeah that's, a good, that, that's a good point, Davey. The CROs, I think, for um, those of you that don't know, are the... Uh, they are the operational know-how for many sponsors to do trials, um, and so basically uh, the sponsor outsources to the CRO the selection of sites. You guys know about that better than us, so you go ahead and, and get your best performing sites. Um, but, and I think uh, that maybe is doing us in the community a disservice. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. So um, remember, uh, some of these are virtual sessions. Uh, these are virtual sessions. You can share, spread the gospel, according to, uh, to Melissa Johnson. Uh, but always exciting to hear you talk, Melissa. I Thank you so I much. I didn't say anything I shouldn't have. Is that <laughs> no, you're always generous. Thank you, Melissa.